this. My message is God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Or in another way of saying it, God gave us loving laws to keep us safe. And I want you to think about this in the sense of it's the beginning of a series we're going to do of the Ten Commandments. I told you last week that the Sunday school class is going to study the Ten Commandments for the next little while. So I thought, why not? We haven't done that. And I think the adults can go back over it. And if you know them so well, and you live them so well, that you don't need to listen to me, you're free to go back and help there or do whatever you want. Yeah, you better sit. All right. Uh, We're going to look at why God gave those two stone tablets to Moses and the people of Israel. What was the reason for that? And then how do we deal with them today? Now, we're not going to necessarily look at that last part today. You've got to come every week to catch it all. All right. Jackie Prischetti in More Dangerous Devotions tells us this. And I want you to hear me. Close your eyes. Just listen to what she says. Take a moment to quiet your heart and be still before God. Think about his power. Think about his creation and all that you see about you. Ask him to open your heart and your eyes to his greatness and to help you appreciate him even more. I think that's, you can open your eyes. I think it's just a really great way to say, put yourself in the presence of God. Be humble before him, be calm before him, and listen, because he has some neat things. First, I want to look at who was Moses? Because since he's the kind of key character in this whole story, I want to say, who is he? And you know what? I'm not going to try to go through the whole thing You want to know about Moses? Start reading the Pentateuch, the five first books of the Bible, and you'll get them. He's all over the place. But there's there's some key thoughts, and some of you remember a lot of these. First, he was an Israelite baby. What a story that was. If you remember, he was going to get killed by the Egyptians, so his mother put him in a basket on a on a on a a reeds on on a little river, and the Egyptian princess got him. And raised him as an Egyptian. So he started out a Jew or an Israelite. And he was raised as an Egyptian. Not only just an Egyptian. But an Egyptian in the courts of the Pharaoh. He was right in the castle. Or the, whatever they called it back there. So he grew up being powerful. In the land of Egypt. Alright. And then. Well one day he just made a boo boo. And he kind of got feeling that there was something going wrong and he killed an Egyptian to defend the Israelite people. And so he had to run away. So he ran away to the Israelites. This guy jumps back and forth. You've got to understand the story of Moses. He runs away to be with the Israelites. And he's out there for a long time. And you can read a whole bunch of that in there. All right. And then one day, lo and behold, he's out on the edge of a hillside and there's this bush. And this bush starts to burn. But it doesn't burn. It's not being consumed. It's just on fire. And then this deep voice says, Moses! And he hits the ground. Because if you understand back then, their understanding of God was real. God's presence was right there. And they understood when God moved and said things. And so he hit the ground. And God said, I have a chore for you. You're going to go and free my people. And understand what Moses' thoughts were going. I just left that place. I killed somebody. If I go back there, I'm dead. But he doesn't say that to God. He just simply says to God, but but, 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 but I can't do that. And God says, oh yeah, you can. And you're going to do this for me. You're going to be my man. And you're going to go off to Egypt and you're going to tell that Pharaoh, let your people go and let my people go and you're going to take my people and get out of there. Well, I don't know about you, but that could have been a real struggle for most of us to think about doing that. Because first of all, Pharaoh isn't really happy with him. And secondly, he's going to go tell the Pharaoh that he has to let all his slaves go got to understand how much the Israelite people were embedded in that Egyptian culture. They were the slaves. They were the ones that were looking after all these people. And he was going to go and say, let me have them all. I'm going to take them all away. Anyway, Moses 
says, well, okay, fine, I'll go do this. And off he goes, and you've all heard the story about how he goes to the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh doesn't listen, and so there's the, the plagues, and then there's the Passover, and finally the people are free to go, but then Pharaoh changes his mind and chases them to the Red Sea, and God opens the sea, lets the Egyptian, or the Israelites through, whops the Egyptians. So you've got to understand the Israelite people and Moses. They know the power of God. They know how awesome this God is and his presence. And, they, and, they, and they've seen him lead them by pillars of light and cloud, by the actions of the Red Sea, by all the plagues. They know the power of God. And what happens when you don't listen? Those Egyptians didn't listen very well. And so we have the setting for what's about to happen. They've been wandering around this desert for three months and not happy. I don't know about you, but if I took a, I don't know, a million, two million people and I said, let's go for a trek and we're going to go across the Sahara Desert. And we didn't plan for it very well, but we're going. And we got about a third or a half of the way in there. And what would be the first thing everybody would say? This was wrong. I can hear it from you guys. Oh, this was a dumb move. This was wrong. We should have stayed where we were because it was way better. And yet, three months ago, they were grumbling that their life was so miserable and God had deserted them and all this stuff. So here they are in this, this desert and they've been wandering around for three months and they come to this mountain, Mount Sinai. And they camp at the bottom of it. And Moses says, I got to go talk to God because... This, uh, these guys are just not listening to me. They're grumbling. They're miserable. Uh, I don't know what to do. So he goes up the mountain and talks to God. And what does God tell him? Well, Exodus 19, 3 to 6. Let's read. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, or to, to Egypt, sorry, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine anyway. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And I want you just to look at that verse 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you'll be my treasured possession, the kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Second verse, verse 6. He made a promise to the people of Israel. And you have to understand that's not the first promise he made. Way back in the days of Abraham, long ways back, a couple of centuries or more, he made a promise to Abraham that Abraham's seed would fill the earth. That his family would fill the earth. He would be, and that would be his, God's people. And here we have these miserable, grouchy Israelites. And Moses gets told, go down there and tell them, if they just smarten up, I'll look after them. Give them this promise. I will do that. Navpress, in its Life Change series on Exodus, gives us a question and answer about this. About covenants. Covenant is, a, is a, an agreement between somebody in a powerful position, a king, your boss at work, all right, and somebody who's of a lower standing. And they make these agreements, but understanding that the person that has the power is the one that initiates it. You don't go and say, I want to make a covenant with you to God, because that doesn't work. God needs to come and give you the covenant. So Navpress says this, the Lord established his covenant with Abraham, and his descendants centuries before, and all God had done or would do was nothing but the fulfillment of that covenant. God promised, and he keeps his promise. And he will continue to do that. Why then did God make another covenant, the Mosaic covenant, this thing with Moses, in addition to the one with Abraham? Why would he do that? He'd already promised they would be his people. This Mosaic covenant was not absolutely new or independent, but it was only a new phase of the Abrahamic covenant. It was necessary because now God's people were no longer a few individuals or a family, but an entire nation. And I'll go into that a little more when we get further down here. All right? Things had changed in the people. God hadn't changed. 
But things had changed in the people in the nation. And so he had to up the ante a little bit. He had to give them a little more than he had given before. God is getting the people ready to hear his next step in being God's chosen people. To be a holy nation, they need to live like a holy nation. Now let's see what they saw, what they saw as this drama continues. Prishgeti, in his book, or in her book, sorry, gives us a vivid description of what the Israelites saw. I want you to imagine this picture because they were right there, standing there at the bottom of that mountain, and this happened. We can only imagine it. The closest I can come is go stand at the bottom of a volcano when it erupts. Okay? This is as close as I can get to it. Here, God gives Moses instructions for the people to cleanse themselves for three days to hear from God. They had to clean themselves completely, including no sexual stuff, including no eating, food, nothing else, washing themselves. They had to really be clean when they came before the presence of God in three days. God was going to talk to them. And they, they were getting. The ground trembled as the Israelites stood in fear and awe. Remember last week I did ah. They were in awe. This is the mighty God moving things. Lightning ripped across the sky and thunder rumbled in the valley below, just like we had yesterday. A thick cloud hovered over the top of the mountain, signaling a loud trumpet blast. And we're not talking about here in the church. It was a blast they heard all over the country. A loud trumpet blast. Then Mount Sinai became covered with smoke, just like our bare mountain got covered in smoke. As the Lord descended on it in fire, and unfortunately the Lord did not descend on it in fire, over there. On Mount Sinai he did. The earth shook, and smoke billowed from the mountain like a furnace. Hot smoke, billowing and flowing off that mountain. Those people felt it. They felt the presence of God. And it was loud, and it was noisy. You know, everybody says, go to God in a, in a calm, clear spirit, and, 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 and be quiet before God. Yeah, but sometimes God's not very quiet. Because sometimes he has to get our attention. And so he gets loud and noisy. In fact, I would love to hear God loud and noisy. I don't know about you, but I just love to hear that. Because then I, it would make me go, whoa. So I'm going to go stand at a volcano someday. Because that's God being loud and noisy. Because it's his, his creation that he's built. The earth shook. The smoke billowed. And what happened? God had already told the people via Moses that they would be God's chosen people if they were obedient and follow God. He's already told them that. They would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses and Aaron go up on that mountaintop and God gives them the Ten Commandments. And you can read it. I'm not going to read it right now, but you should read Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. That's your homework for next week. All right? Uh, Exodus 21 to 17 is the Ten Commandments. All right. Exodus 20, 23, though, tells us this. Do not make any gods to be alongside of me. Do, make, do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. So God has told the people, wait for me, be patient, honor me, praise me, but don't make other gods. And I'm just going to make point this out because it was pointed out to me in your bulletins. And there's a little list of the Ten Commandments on the inside front page. And the second one says, do not worship statues. Well, idols are not just statues. Idols are anything that takes your thoughts, mind, eyes off of God. It could be your family, it could be your pastor, it could be your job, it could be money, it could be your fancy car, it could be your favorite TV show, I don't know. But if you've put something before God, that's an idol. That's a tidbit for sight. All right, so he says, don't make any of those things. Don't do it. Particularly, nothing in God, no gods of silver or gold. And there's a reason for this. Because in chapters 21 to 31 of Exodus, you get all these details. Remember I told the kids? There's a lot of rules and you get a lot of details. The, and remember when it said back here that the, the Ten Commandments came because the nation had changed? It wasn't just one or two families now. It was a nation. So you need a lot more rules. You need a lot more details. And in every group of people, there are those who just want simple rules and there are those who want details. Those of us that ask why, 
God has to answer the why. And so he gives us 10 chapters of details. And trust me, when you read through those, you're not going to like some of them. They are not fun. And if, we, if, if, if he came and said, right now, today, we're going to get things back in order here, and that's the way it's going to be, wow, we'd have a hard time adjusting to that set of rules. Just have a look at it. Go have a read, and you lose your time. Exodus 31.18 says, When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of a stone inscribed by the finger of God. God wrote right on those, he got, he got Moses to chisel these stones, tablets out, and God wrote on the front and back of them the Ten Commandments. He gave them to Moses and said, now go, take that down to the people, let them see this, they'll get it, they'll understand, because they're my people. So, Moses comes down off the mountain with Aaron and these two stone tablets and they come walking up to the the wonderful tribe of Israel and what are they doing? They're praising and worshipping a golden calf. An idol made out of gold. Well, you got to understand Moses. That poor boy has been working his tail off to get these people to where they're supposed to be going to this thing called the promised land. This place that God promised Abraham and that he was going to get him there. And he told Moses, take my people there. And so he's trying to get them there. But it's kind of like herding sheep. It's not an easy chore. Or pushing a rope. I like that connotation. It's really hard to push a rope until you do something like freeze it or something like that. All right. He's been working his tail off doing this. He's been up and down the mountain a few times. He's been in the presence of God. He's been in the presence of people. He's been... I don't know if he ever slept and ate. Never says. But here's poor Moses. He's been doing all this for these people. And he comes walking down the hill. And the first time he's away. Now he was away for 40 days. But the first time he's away. They go back to doing the stupid stuff. And they go and they have this wonderful golden calf. And they're praising him and having a party. And, and doing things. So what's he do? I don't know if I would have done this. That was pretty gutsy of him in a sense. But he was so mad and so frustrated. He took the stone tablets and threw them on the ground and shattered them. I don't think I'm going to take God's Bible (laughs) and go and burn it or throw it away. I just have scary thoughts of what that does. But he was so mad that the people were not doing what God had specifically said, do not do. I mean, it's one thing if you you have a a rule and you kind of sort of break it. You know how we go 110 in a 100 kilometer zone? Right? Okay. Um, we just sort of break it. And we get away with it because it's just sort of broken. Yeah, well, well, these right people, at least they didn't do it that way. They really did it. They took one of the, the main things and they just blew it out the window. And so God's punishment should have been to wipe out that Israelite people. And you know what? If I was Moses, I'd be sitting there getting cookie God. Whack them. Because they just totally don't get it. And they're totally evil. And they're just ugly. But Moses doesn't do that. He does, he does. He has so much love for God that God's love was in him. And he went to God and he says, hold it, whoa, 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 whoa. Before you do the dirty and, and wipe them out, hear me. I think there's hope here. I think this people can come around. I think these are your people. You promised them that they were your people. You need to give them another chance. You just got to give them another chance. Well, God said, okay, come back up the mountain. Now, between the breaking of the first set and him going up the mountain for the second set, there's a few chapters. Go ahead and read them. You'll get a whole bunch of details. All right? But he goes back up the mountain. And God gets him to chisel two more stone tablets out. And God writes all of them again. And he stays up there for a while talking to God and trying to calm down and and, and, and get the understanding and praising God because God was doing this again and having patience. And this time, the people of Israel got it. They didn't stray aside. They stayed and waited and waited and waited for Moses to come back down. And Moses came back down with this newly inscribed duplicate Ten Commandments. 
and say, okay, we need to start living this. We need to start using these and learning from them and growing with them. There is so much in this story. I'm just giving you the highlights. There is so much in here that I encourage you to read the book of Exodus. Because if you read the book of Exodus, you'll understand where we are today. Because you see, we were just like the people of Israel. We wandered in the wilderness. We might still be wandering in the wilderness. And some of you who have found God might still be wandering in the wilderness because they did that too. If your life has not got direction, if you're struggling, if you're wandering around trying to figure out where God fits in the whole thing, read the book of Exodus. Because God made a couple of promises that he's never broken and he will never break. And that biggest one is what he said to Moses. He said, if you obey and follow me, I will make you my holy nation. And you know, he was talking to the Israelite people at that time. But when Jesus came and died on that cross and resurrected, he said basically the same thing. Follow me and I'll show you the way. And you will be my people. Terry's paraphrase. All right? Jesus came along and did exactly what God had done in the Exodus. He showed the people the way. He showed the people how to get back to God. And that's, that's what was happening there, was the people had strayed away, and God had to find a way to bring them back. And in that particular case, he used Moses on the mountain. And he used his, his ominous presence on that mountain, in the smoke, and the cloud, and the fire. In the New Testament time, he used Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. And by the way, there was some loud noise in that one too because the earth shook and the di went dark. The veil ripped apart. Things shattered and banged. All right? God moves when he wants us to learn things. So the next time you have a real shakeup in your life, things really get messed up or shook up, maybe look to see if God's trying to get your attention. Maybe he's just trying to say to you, you've come this far, now I want you to go further. I want you to experience something even greater than you have. But you have to listen. And you have to be willing to follow. We, we looked at why God had these tablets in writing to the Israelite people. They were there to help them get some organization and some structure in their nation. Because you remember also, this is a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of people who have been slaves up until three months ago. So they haven't had to plan their day. They haven't had to plan their, their country, their, their people. They haven't had to have governing. They haven't had to look after anything other than in their own little families where they tried to keep the structure of mom, dad, and kids and God in the top of it. They haven't had to do any of that. And now all of a sudden, there they are. You're your own country. Oh, by the way, I'm going, to go, I'm going to give you the land, but you better be ready for it, so you've got to get yourself organized. That's what God was doing. Very similar to the world today. Take a look around. I don't know about you, but the population seems to be growing still, and to the point where people are getting all panicky about, oh, what are we going to do in another 20 years? Population is growing, and... It's not really organized, is it? Look around the world today. It's not doing well. Just like those Israelite people. So what did God do for them? He came along and said, here, I'm going to give you some guidelines, some rules, some responsibilities. That'll help you get focused. That's what our world needs today. And you know what? Our government, I don't know about you, I'm in the world of finance and, and legalities, and they're changing stuff every day more and more rules more and more regulations more and more details and I'm going eh. but it's because our world's falling apart and they have to start making a rule for everything that's going wrong and I look at that and I go this is really cool because it's kind of a model that God gave the problem is they're not looking at it for God's rules they're creating man's rules, which does not solve the problem. 
So I want to say, I think we need to be really praying that as Leonard's learning in his role in the government, as the government is talking and working together and trying to come up with rules, we need to be praying hard for them that they will look at God's rules. Not just mankind's rules. Look at God's rules. Let them go back and look at the Ten Commandments. And if they want, they can read all those ten chapters of all the little details too. Because they already got theirs. They might as well find the right ones. Okay? Problem is, we make up our own rules and we're leaving God's commandments, rules, and guidelines behind. And we shouldn't do that. One of the things that I want to point out is just like when Moses came down off that mountain with those tablets, all right, and found the golden calf issue going on, we see today that man has started to worship things instead of God. Take a look around our world. Take a look around our community. You see people worshiping all kinds of things. And I'm going to point on one because I know it just bugs everybody. But you've all got a cell phone or a smartphone. That is one of the subtlest ways that, that, that people and mankind and Satan can get at you and take your life away from God. Now, saying that, it could, it's a tool. The phone itself is not evil. Do not believe I do not believe that tools are evil. It's the users and the method behind it. Cell phones can be wonderful things. You can put the Bible app on there. And you can have devotions and you can have studies and you can have videos. And you want to have a good video on the Bible app. It's a plug for the Bible app. On the Bible app, there's a video called the Torah. And if you want to know where I got the inspiration of how to do this thing today, go watch that little video. It's fun. But it's all exactly what I was just doing today. Telling a story. Telling the story of what Moses was doing and what God was doing through Moses and what the people of Israel were tr needing to learn and do. So what should we do? What will God do? That's a better question. The Bible tells us what we should do. But what will God do right now? Over the next 10 Sundays, we're going to look at each of these commandments. The first 10. Not all the details. But the first 10. And we're going to see what they meant to the people then and why they were there, why, they, why God gave them those particular, why those particular ten? I always wondered about that. All right? And then how do those apply today? How do they apply today? One of my favorite ones is, is the one that says, do not lie. But you have to come back to find out why. All right? We're going to look at God, what God wants us to do today with his word with his law. And we're going to look at how we can make our lives better by following God, by listening to him. Because that's what it's really all about. That's why we're here. If you are not planning on listening to God, what are you doing sitting here? It's not just the corn roast. You're in this building today, right now, because your heart wanted to hear from God. The Holy Spirit, as we started this service with, the Holy Spirit is in us, around us, and here in this presence right now. God is right here with us, and that's why you're here. You can have all kinds of other reasons and ideas. Some of you would say, oh, no, no, but I'm here because of... Or some of the kids would say, I'm here because mom brought me. All right? And I hear that one lots. Although those three eager beavers, I don't think, had a problem. Okay? But why are you here? Why are you sitting here today, right now? What did you come for? I believe you came because God said, you need to come here. There's a message I have for you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what part of this whole service or the fellowship afterwards is going to be the thing that speaks to you, but God has a message for you because he promises he will tell us things. He promises he will show us things. And he promises, just like his rules say, that if we follow and obey him, he will make us his holy people. Do you want to be holy? I do. So let's be holy together. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this awesome time together where we can just hear about you. And that we can get an idea of how you move and shake in the world. Lord, I, I praise you for the patience, patience you had with your people back in Israel's days of Moses. They, they, they just struggled so hard following you. 
And I just praise you that you were able to patiently wait for them to follow. Thank you for Moses who gave us such a direction, such a, a way to look at life and a way to follow you and to understand that he was just another man, just like you and I, just like all of us. But you had touched him and you showed him and he followed. Father, help us to do the same. Every day, all day, help us to be aware of your presence. Help us to be looking for your answers, your guidance, and the way that you would want us to live. And then let us take that and show it to other people. And Father, when Moses came down off that mountain the second time, his face shone. It was bright and radiant. And Lord, we just pray that you, as, as we think of that, we realize that your presence is right here like back then. And that our faces should shine. We should be radiant, letting people know that we were in your presence today. Thank you, Father, that you love us so much. That you take us however we come. You take us in whatever shape or form we're in, whatever mood we're in, whatever our conditions are. Father, you've accepted us graciously. Help us to do the same and accept you as graciously to take that gift of salvation, that gift of free life, long, eternal life, by saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Be with us now. Guide us as we go forward this week in your son's precious name. And as Lord, as we think of the city, I think of that prayer that we've been doing all year, and I just ask that you will take all the families of this town and that you will bless them and that you will give them your knowledge, if they don't know you yet, your love, if they don't have it yet, and your excitement, if they do, to be able to share it with others. Thank you, Father, that we can do that and that we can be your family, your holy nation in this world today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.